and spirit means breath in the book of Genesis when God had made the clay figurine that was later to be Adam he breathed the breath of life into its nostrils and it became alive because life is breath but now if you hold your breath you lose it he that would save his life will lose it so breathe in, breathe in, breathe in, get as much air as you can and Krishna clean and you lose it so nirvana means breathe out what a relief that was <laughs> the sigh of relief let it go because it will come back to you if you let it go but if you don't let it go you'll just suffocate so a person in the state of nirvana is what we might call a blown out person like blow your mind <laughs> let go don't cling and then you're in the state of nirvana and I re-emphasize the point this is not, I, I, I'm not preaching, see I'm not saying this is what you ought to do I'm simply pointing out a state of affairs that is so there's no moralism in this whatsoever it's simply pointing out like if you put your hand into the fire you'll get burned you can get burned if you want to that's okay but if you so happens that you don't want to get burned and you don't put your hand in the fire so in the same way if you don't want to be in a state of anxiety all the time and again I emphasize if you like to be anxious it's perfectly all right if that's see Buddhism never hurries anyone on they say you've got all eternity through which to live in various forms and therefore you, you, you don't have just one life in which you've got to avoid eternal damnation you can go running around the wheel and the rat race and play that game just as long as you want to so long as you think it's fun but if there comes a time when you don't think it's fun you don't have to do it so I wouldn't say to anyone who disagrees with me and who says well uh, I think we ought to engage the forces of evil in battle and put this world to right and so on and so forth and arrange everything in this world so that it's all up try it please uh, it's perfectly okay go on doing that <laughs> but uh, if you see that it's futile then uh, you can let go don't try to cling relax and if you do that you're in the state of nirvana and you become a Buddha and of course it means that you become a rather astonishing person you may of course be subtle about it and uh, make like you're a very ordinary person so that you don't um, get people mixed up and so in Buddhism the Buddha explained that his doctrine, his method, was a raft. It's sometimes called a yana. The word y-a-n-a, -A, yana, means a vehicle, a conveyance. And when you cross a river on a raft, and you get to the other shore, you don't pick up the raft and carry it on your back. You leave it behind. But people who are what I would call hooked on religion are always on the raft. They're going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth on the raft. Uh, so the clergyman tends to turn into a ferryman who's always on the raft and never gets over to the other shore himself. Now something to be said for that because how are we going to get the raft back to the first shore to bring over the other people? See? Somebody has to volunteer to take the back journey. <laughs> but he must be awfully careful to realize that the real objective 
is to get the people across and set them free. If you dedicate yourself to ferrying people across, don't ask them to come back on the raft with you. Because you'll get overcrowded and people will think that the raft is the goal rather than the other shore. <laughs> so when uh, I find this in, in actual practice, that when clergymen uh, do not ever ask for money, and uh, it's all right, you know, like a doctor who simply charges a fee, says, you come to me, you pay me so much. But the clergyman says, uh, he doesn't say pay me so much. He says, uh, we would like your pledge, your voluntary contribution. See, and then nobody knows what to give. That's the idea of the raft. Now then the fourth noble truth uh, is called Marga. This word means path, and uh, the way of Buddhism is often called the Noble Eightfold Path, because there are eight phases, I won't say steps, because they're not sequential. Um, samyak is a very curious phrase doesn't mean right in our sense of correct. Sum is the same really as our word sum. Total, complete, uh, all inclusive. Uh, we might say, we might use the word integrated as when we say a person has integrity. That a person who has integrity, we mean he's all of a piece. He's not divided against himself. So, in this sense of samyak, drishti, this is uh, related to the word darshan, which means the point of view, or viewing. When you go to visit a great guru or teacher, you have darshan, you look at it, and you offer your reverence to it, darshan many senses of it, but it means simply to view, look at the view. So the Samyak Darshan is the complete view. For example, let's take the constellation called the Big Dipper. We look at it from a fairly restricted zone in space, and it always seems, whatever the season of the year, because we're so far away from it, that those stars in the Big Dipper are in the same position. But imagine looking at it from somewhere else in space altogether, and those stars would not look like a dipper. They'd be in another position. Now then, what is the true position of those stars? Don't you see there isn't one? Because wherever you look, the position alters. You could say that the true situation of those stars is how they are looked at from all points of view, all possible points of view. Inside the constellation looking outwards, outside the constellation looking inwards, from everywhere and everywhere. But you see, there is no such thing as the truth. Uh, the world, in other words, is not existing independently of those who witness it. Because the world is precisely the relationship between the world and its witnesses. And so if there are no eyes in this world, the sun doesn't make any light, nor do the stars. So what is, is a relationship. You can, for example, prop up two sticks by leaning them against each other, and they will stand. But only by depending on each other. Take one away and the other falls. So in Buddhism it is taught that everything in this universe depends on everything else. That we have a kind of a huge network, and this is called the doctrine of mutual interdependence.
All of it hangs on you, and you hang on all of it, just as the two sticks support each other. And this is conveyed in a symbol which is called Indra's net. Imagine a multidimensional spider's web in the early morning covered with dewdrops. And every dewdrop contains the reflection of all the other dewdrops. And in each reflected dewdrop, the reflections of all the other dewdrops in that reflection. And so ad infinitum. That is the Buddhist conception of the, of the universe in an image. The Japanese call that Jiji Muge. A Ji means a thing event, a happening. So between happening and happening, Mu, there is no Ge separation. Gigi Muge. Now, uh, so the first phase of the Eightfold Path has to do with one's view, understanding of the world. The second phase uh, has to do with action, how you act. Buddhist idea of ethics is based on expediency. If you are engaged in the way of liberation and uh, you want to clarify your consciousness, doing that is inconsistent with certain kinds of action. So every Buddhist makes five vows, five precepts. And you may uh, perhaps have heard the Buddhist formula of taking what is called Panchasila, the five precepts. And uh, they take uh, what are called Tisarana, the three refuges and the five precepts. The refuges are the Buddha, the Dharma, the doctrine, and the Sangha, the fellowship of all those who are on the way. So, uh, the priest, uh, the bhikkhu, the uh, Buddhist monk, mm. and the lay people will chant the formula. Buddhanga sarangatami, Dhanganga sarangatami, Sanghanga sarangatami. Those are the three refuges the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. Then they take the five precepts. Anatipata Vermani Sikapadanga Samadhyami Adinadana Vermani Sikapadanga Samadhyami Kamesu Michachara Vermani Sikapadanga Samadhyami Musa Vada Vermani Sikapadanga Samadhyami Kamesu Michachara Veramani, no, Sura Merya Majapamadatana Veramani Sikapadam Samadhyami. So they take these five precepts. Panadipada. I undertake the precept to abstain from taking life. Adinadana. I undertake the precept to abstain from taking what is not given. Kamesu Mityahara. I undertake the precept to abstain from exploiting the passions. Musavada. I undertake the precept to abstain from falsifying speech. Sura Maria Majapamadatana. I undertake the precept to abstain from being intoxicated by Sura Maria and Majapamadatana, whatever they were. <laughs> uh, I presume toddy uh, with his alcohol. Um, I don't know. I don't know what else it was. Nobody does know. Because you, you see, if you start killing people, 
uh, or uh, taking life, you're in trouble. You set up an opposition and you've got to become involved in taking care of it. If you start stealing, you worry people. You upset people's orientation in life because if you suddenly come into the back home for dinner and find somebody's stolen your table, where are you going to serve dinner? Uh, if you exploit your passions, um, it means that uh, when, you're, when you feel bored, uh, somehow the life is a little bit empty, you say, well, now what are we going to do this evening? Let's go and get stuffed. There are a lot of people who suffer from obesity are trying to simply fill their empty psyche by stuffing themselves with food. Well, it's the wrong cure. So, uh, likewise, Musavada, if you start telling lies to everybody, you know what happens when you start telling lies. You have to tell extra lies to cover up the first one, and you get into the most hopeless misunderstanding. Speech collapses. And, of course, the intoxication is the same problem as the exploitation of the passions. So there's a purely kind of practical, expedient, utilitarian approach to morals. There's another side to this which doesn't enter into the, into the precepts, which I will explain later. So, that's the third phase of the Eightfold Path. Then, the, no, the second phase. Then the third phase has to do with your mind, with your state of consciousness. And this has to do with what we would ordinarily call meditation. There are the two final, the, the seventh and eighth uh, aspects of the path are called Samyak Shmriti and Samyak Samadhi. Shmriti means recollection. Kaboom. That's the best English word for it. Now, do you understand? The word recollect is to gather together what has been scattered. What is the opposite of remember? No. Obviously, dismember. What has been chopped up and scattered becomes remembered. So in the 